shall we? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alhamdulillah we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity once again of continuing with our book Sahih al-Bukhari this seventh it's today seventh yeah seventh day of um Jimada Ula, 1,437 years after the hijrah of our noble Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam from Mecca to Medina. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we're supposed to continue reading the 318th hadith in the book Sahih al-Bukhari, chapter 28 or 29. Uh, the chapter dealing with Haid. But insha'Allah ta'ala, today we will not take the book. We will, we will answer questions, but before we answer questions, we'll take... Um, we will deal a little with an issue that is supposed to be a source of concern to many Muslims, in fact all over the world, not just in Nigeria, but particularly the turn that this is taking is supposed to frighten those of us who are Nigerians. Just like in other countries, they have also been frightened by such uh, developments in their countries too. And I am talking about the news recently that a student of this institution was arrested in Kano while he was attempting to defect to Syria where he was supposed to go and join the ISIS. He was arrested and uh, from all we're hearing, confessional statements from him show that they had already sent some other people there. So he was like uh, a point man or what do I say? He was standing, he was like their agent sending people to them from here. Of course that means money was changing hands and so on. I even hear that some sisters have also joined. These are all students who were sent to school by their parents. They came to school and uh, somehow, Wallahu ta'ala alam, they got brainwashed they swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the ideologies that were planted in them. And as a result of that, they made the resolve that they would leave this country with or without the permission of their parents. I hear that the one in, from this institution, that when his mother right now is in coma, his father also is in a very terrible situation. 
because they were struck by the news that their son had decided to join such a group. They never had an idea that he had such ideas and he never in any way told them that he was going to travel for such a mission. As far as this brother is concerned and people like him, there is no sin in doing that without the consent of their parents. Because they say, لا طاعة المخلوق في معصية الخالق If a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala urges you to sin against Allah, you do not obey him. And so they think if they tell their parents, their parents will ask them not to go, and that will be sinning against Allah. And so in the first place, they even have no reason to want to seek the consent of their parents. If we ask such people, I'm sure their response, if you were to ask them, what, what are you going to seek through the jihad? What do you want Allah to do to you? They would tell you that they want Allah to be pleased with them. Because they are going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by participating in that bloodbath which is called the jihad. Thus their understanding that they are going to seek Allah's pleasure. It's okay. Is it not Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that said, رِضَ اللَّهِ فِي رِضَ الْوَالِدَيْنِ That Allah will not be pleased with you if your parents aren't pleased with you. Why at least will somebody decide to take major decisions in their lives even though they have to completely put aside their parents. If it is ibadah that you want to engage in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala urges the Muslim to be very kind to the parents, to be nice to them, to treat them as well as possible. Of course you will say that they are standing between you and obedience to Allah. Because what you want to go for is jihad and that is worship of Allah and so you don't need a human being's permission to go and worship Allah. And then we will ask, have you read the history of all the jihad that took place in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? Have you read it? Have you been taught? Do you know the conditions of jihad in Islam? Have you not read that somebody wanted to go but then his parents did not allow him and the Prophet said stay and go to your parents. Don't go since they do not allow you to go. This is an authentic hadith, my brothers and sisters in Islam. So why would somebody neglect such a thing? If Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam insisted that you seek your parents' consent and that if they do not consent, then you stay back and not participate. If Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would say that to somebody, If Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would say that to somebody, why should we think that it will not apply to us? That is one. But that, that is not even the main issue here. The issue is what you want to go for is jihad. And we know that jihad is aslum min usul al-deen. There is no time that jihad will be abrogated. Jihad is compulsory on conditions. And the ummah must have it at the back of their minds every time that they will need to fight to liberate the deen of Islam. They will need to fight the enemies of Islam to liberate Muslims who are being oppressed 
by some kuffar. Especially, for example, the Muslims in uh, Philistine who are being oppressed by the kuffar of the place that is known as Israel today. Of course, the Muslims of Syria who are being oppressed by the Shiite leader Assad and so on and so forth. It's compulsory that Muslims fight to liberate such people. But if we say something is compulsory on you, it has conditions. Jihad was discussed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. It was discussed by Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his ahadith. So it's not a new thing in Islam. In fact, the conquest of Makkah was through a jihad. There was the one to Tabuk, there was the one of Ahzab, there was the one of Khandaq, there was the one of Badr, about the greatest of them all. There was the one of Uhud, and so on and so forth. There were Ghazawat, in which in fact some of them Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated physically. So they all had conditions. There is no way we can come and institute another jihad now without taking into cognizance those conditions that have been laid. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam gave some of them or gave all of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them in the Quran. Rasul came with the message and in his ahadith he also mentioned some. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We know that there is an ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. There is no ayah in the Quran that has abrogated that ayah. So that ayah is a muhkam. The hukum in it is muhkam. It's not been abrogated. Even though it did not happen in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but all the ulama of sunnah, who have written books to do the tafsir of that ayah, have always referred to it as an ayah that you return to if you want to know some basic things about jihad in Islam. And that ayah discusses the people of Samuel. Alam tara ila al-mala'i من بني إسرائيل من بعد موسى إذ قالوا لنبي الله مبعث لنا ملك النقاتل في سبيل الله. Those people were oppressed. They were being killed, and so they were fleeing their homes because they had been chased out. And so they went to نبي الله that is Samuel. They went to him and complained. That's the first thing they did. They went to Nabiyyin lahum. They went to a prophet of theirs that they had. If you want to go for this jihad, who do you go to between you and Allah? Who do you go to? You don't have a Nabi now. So who do you go to and seek permission? Who will command you to go for the jihad? Who in place of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? If you're here and you want to go and help the Muslims in Syria, which is permissible by the way, who will you go to? Who should you go to? Those people went to their Prophet. They did not appoint a leader by themselves. They went to their prophet and said, choose for us a leader, so that he will lead us in our fight. So these young stars that are going there, who did they consult? We are here in Nigeria, we are Nigerians. We have an Islamic leadership, whether we like the person or not. You see, for you to say you have a leader, it doesn't have to be somebody you love. It doesn't have to be somebody you like. 
It doesn't have to be your choice. It just has to be that he is the one that has the sultah and he becomes your leader automatically whether you like him or not. That's how Islam goes. So you don't decide that this person must be your leader. When Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu was chosen as the leader of the Muslims, there were some people that would have preferred Ali bin Abi Talib. I'm sure you remember that. There were some people that preferred Ali bin Abi Talib. But then the majority were with Uthman bin Affan. The Ahlu Shura, the majority of them were with Uthman bin Affan. And at the end of the day, what happened? Uthman bin Affan emerged the leader. And at the end of the day, Ali bin Abi Talib did the bay'ah. He did the mubaya'ah to Uthman bin Affan. And so automatically, every other person that liked Ali would have to like Uthman bin Affan, radiallahu anhu. It just became automatic because Uthman was the one that was officially declared, not Ali bin Abi Talib, and he had to accept it. When Abu Bakr and Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, was chosen, there were some people who wanted to rebel. The Ansar wanted to rebel. Some Ansar wanted to rebel. They said they helped the Muhajirun when they had nothing. They did this and that, and so they deserve it. They deserve the leadership. Abu Bakr and As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu said to them, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said that the leader of the Muslims must be a Qurashi. And that's an authentic hadith. And because they were mu'minun, when they heard the hadith, and it was confirmed to be an authentic hadith, they submitted. If they are the Quraysh, then no other person will seek that leadership. Nobody will seek, no mu'min will seek to be the Khalifa of the Muslim Ummah in the entire world, if they are the Quraysh and they still pray. You see, but individuals come up today and say, this person is not a Muslim. And so, nothing from him is binding on us. His leadership is not binding on us, because by their own, by their own verdict, the person is a kafir. But we all know that a group of people, five, six, seven hotheads, cannot just come together and declare somebody a kafir and the whole world will accept we are not all juhal. We have the hadith before us. We have Bukhari, we have Muslim. We have Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nasai ibn Majah. We have Sunan al-Bayhaqi before us. We have as siyasat al-Shari'iyya before us. We have books and books and books in which knowledge is printed. And so we just can't take everything hook, line and sinker because some hothead just came with it and said it has to be like that. If you say anything, we will examine it on the wazan of Qur'an and Sunnah. And that's what I urge you all to do. Don't just accept statements like that, because somebody comes and quotes the Qur'an and quotes the Hadith, quotes ayat of jihad and so on, and that's all. You flare, you want jihad. Jihad... You don't want it as much as I do. You don't want it as much as other ulama do. You don't. You can't, you can't say for sure that you do because you don't know. You don't know ghaib. You don't know what other people have done that you may never even have imagined. The efforts that some people have made for this deen, you will never be able to make till you die. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has naturally made some people uh, superior to others. There is nothing you can do about it. So it's not how much of uh, overzealousness you show that will make you the mu'min that you hope to be. There were people in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were extremists. They understood Islam and they wanted to take it to the extreme. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa always cautioned them. 
Because if you take this religion like that, it will overpower you. لَنْ يَشَادَّ هَذَا الدِّينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبَةٌ it's not possible for anybody to go to the extreme in this religion except that at a time in his life he will not be able to practice it. It will overpower him. It will become impossible for him or her to practice the deen. You have to take it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to us. And it has to be that you will take example from the teachings of the sahaba concerning the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi so first of all, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, if you want to go for jihad, the first thing you have to do is know that you are under an Islamic leadership. Secondly, there are different types of jihad. There is the jihad in which Muslims will come together under their leader and go to another land to fight the jihad. But then there is another jihad in which you are sitting in your homes and people come and attack you. So you now fight back. قَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Those ones who have come to fight you and they are fighting you, fight back. But do not exceed your bounds. Do not exceed your limit. So even then, do not exceed your limit, but then fight back. Because you have been fought now, they have come to your homes and they are burning your homes, they are shooting your children, and so on. You don't need anybody's permission there. But if you want to go out on the assault, in that case you need permission. You have to know that you have an Islamic leadership. And in this case, in our case, it is the Sultan of Sokoto that is the leader of the Muslims. Whether you like him or not, that is how it is, Islamically speaking. Because Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, Alaykum bis sam'i wa ta'a wa in ta'ammara alaykum abd. In the riwayah Habashi. Even if it is somebody you do not desire, Somebody you feel is not qualified for the leadership. As long as he is the one that has emerged the leader, then you have to listen to him and you have to obey him. So how do we just get up now and form another leadership when we have this one? What do we go and tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That we loved the religion more than the Sahaba, more than the Tabi'un, more than the Tabi'ut Tabi'in, that we now know the religion more than the scholars, or we just feel all scholars that do not have this view are perverse. It's a very terrible thing that young boys will just come up now and say every other person is perverted. Only the one, two, three scholars that they have chosen, only those ones are on the straight path. This is one of the indications of fitna. This is one indication that you are min ahlil bid'ah. That you on your own decide who is on the straight path. And then you also decide who is not on the straight path. You send the others parking and then the religion becomes yours. You are not using the hadith, you are not using the Quran, you are not using the aqwal of sahaba. That's a very terrible thing to happen to anybody who is a Muslim enthusiast. So first of all, we need that leadership. Secondly, wallahi, your parents have to agree. Because this jihad now, if we consider it jihad, the one in Syria, that jihad is fardu kifaya, is not fardu ayn. It's not binding on every individual Muslim. It's just binding on some Muslims that have been selected officially, Islamically speaking. Those who have been selected to go and fight that war, it's binding on them. And it has to be that they were selected by leaders, not just by one agent. 
Somebody comes and just tries to convince you and he says we'll give you so so dollars and so on and then we'll take you to that place and then he bamboozles you with some words and you're convinced. That is not how people are selected for jihad in Islam. It's the leader that will say you, you and you go. We work under leadership. We are a civilized nation. We don't just behave like that. Islam does not harbor criminals. Islam does not encourage anarchy. Islam does not encourage unnecessary rebellion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always cautioned us against unnecessary rebellion. They cautioned us against anarchy. And they caution, cautioned us against extremism in the deen. And these are the things that we're seeing now. I remember that some of these young people, some of them were in a group that was created <coughs> on WhatsApp, in which were supposed to answer questions from brothers and sisters concerning the deen. And from the beginning the rule was, Nobody should post anything in that group except a question. If it's not a question, you are not allowed to post anything there. That's the rule. And these boys started breaking the rules. And of course their excuse will be that since the rules are not the rules of Allah, they can break them. Is it not Allah that permitted leadership amongst the Muslims? If somebody created a group and said, this is the rule, you have to say that Islam says that rule is wrong. Maybe the Quran says the rule is wrong. If the Quran has not particularly said this rule is wrong, you can't say it's wrong. You don't have the right as an individual to say it's wrong. Unless the Quran or the Sunnah have said it is wrong. If you come to somebody's majlis, an alim, he has to allow you to talk before you talk. And if he says, I'm teaching only hadith, don't ask me questions concerning the Quran. And then you say what? You say he's an enemy of the Quran because he said you shouldn't ask on the Quran? Is that how to think? You ask him only on hadith. If he says, no, ask me only on the Qur'an, I don't know the hadith, don't ask me about the hadith. You don't have to ask him. You can go somewhere to somebody who knows the hadith and ask him. So you find that what you're being taught is disobedience. And then some of them, immediately when they were cautioned against some of the things they were doing, because somebody posted at the time that they were going to vote, he said, do not vote, if you vote you are a kafir. He posted such a thing in that group. And then initially they used to say, Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthameen also said it is kufr to vote. Bin Baaz said it is kufr to vote. This one said it is kufr to vote. And so on and so forth. And then we went through the fatawa of this imma and we saw a completely different thing. Do you have to lie? against a scholar, just to make your point? Is it Jannah that you're seeking? Are you seeking paradise? Are you seeking Allah's pleasure? If you have to lie against a scholar, just to make a point? Just to gain acceptance? It is not through being desperate that we will win any jihad. If we want Philistine to be free, we have to eschew desperation. We have to calm down and do what is right. And obey the rules and follow these things one by one. At Allah's appointed time, Philistine will be free. Insha'Allah ta'ala. But it doesn't have to do with how much desperation we show. The more desperation you show, the more you fail. When those people said, choose for us a leader, so that he will lead us in a fight 
We want to fight those who are oppressing us so that we gain our freedom. The Prophet asked them, Are you sure? Are you sure that if you are commanded to fight, you will fight? And they said, Yes, they are sure. And then the first thing Allah tried them with was that He chose for them a leader that they felt was unqualified. Allah chose for them a leader that they felt was unqualified. How can he be the leader? ونحن أحق بالملك منه. He is not rich. When he is not rich, he is poor. How can a poor person be our leader when we are rich? And then we are all, in fact, we deserve the leadership more than him. That's what they thought. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thought differently. Because Allah knows and they do not know. So if Allah chooses the Sultan of Sokoto for us, when we think it should have been somebody else, we should refer to this ayah and remind ourselves of the fact that though we thought it should have been somebody else, Allah knows why He gave it to this man. Allah knows why He gave it to him, and so we submit and follow him. Hajjaj bin Yusuf, a thakafi, was a very terrible person. The Sahaba did not like him. The Tabi'un did not like him. But since he was the leader, they followed him. He killed some of them. Yet, they still followed him as the leader. Because they always remembered. They always used to remember the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the fitan. And how people will go astray if they become overzealous in such matters. That once Allah has made this person a leader, then asam wa ta'a. That is how the ummah will be sane. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, I am not saying that what is happening in Nigeria is right. It's not right. If the sharia is not in operation, it's not right. That's not how it should be. This land is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the laws of Allah should reign supreme. The whole of the world is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it should be the sharia that should reign there. But do you remember that the Muslims went to uh, 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 what is um, Al-Najashi of Habasha? They went to him. He was not a Muslim. They lived under him. Did they recognize his leadership or did, did they not? They did. They recognized his leadership. Even though he was a non-Muslim. At the time they went. He was a Christian. But they recognized his leadership. So Islam is not that religion in which you operate under some utopia. This is what you think should be. This is the ideal thing. And that's what must be. It's not always like that. We are realistic. This is what you want. If you can't get it, you may do with what you have. Until such a time that Allah brings that which you want. So I urge you to calm down. And to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to know... That there are some little things you negate. There are some little things you look down upon. That if you hold fast onto them, Wallahi, Allah will assist you, whether you fight physically or not. Because <clears throat> Allah knows that your hands are tied. Even in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were al-mustad'afeen. There were ulu darar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted their excuse, made excuses for them, and pardoned them, even though they could not go to fight. So Allah could put you in a situation in which you, not, you, you do not yet have the chance to go and do what you would have wanted to do. 
But that which Allah has permitted you to do, you do. These young people that are leaving their parents now, how much da'wah have they made to the parents? How much efforts have they put into guiding those parents to the path of Islam? Is it the people over there that are more important to your parents? Ridallahi fi ridal walidayn. What efforts have you made to bring your parents out of the dark to the light of Islam? Is that not more important than a jihad outside your own country when your country is burning? And what is it we call a jihad? Those people, a few of them a spoonful, who came together. Do you know how al-Baghdadi emerged the so-called leader of the Muslim world? Does any of you here know how he was chosen? Do we know? Does anybody know how the Muslim world came together and declared him their leader? If you now say, okay, the world did not accept him, but he emerged the leader. How did he emerge the leader? How does he have power over all other Muslims? How are we able to implement what he says in Nigeria, for instance? How do people implement what he says in Saudi Arabia? Is he a Qurashi? Why has he emerged the leader when they are at the Quraysh? Isn't there any Muslim Qurashi? Aren't there leaders that are leading in Saudi Arabia where you have the Kaaba and the Masjid of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If we do, how has somebody unseated them? If he says their Islam is not right, have you ever tested al-Baghdadi's Islam? Have you ever had the chance to compare him to the leaders of Saudi and to say that he is a better Muslim? Maybe you shouldn't forget that he was trained by the CIA. If they say that the leaders of Saudi are connected to America, he was trained by the CIA. Is CIA from the Kaaba? Is it from Masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's not. They all have been connected to this kuffar. So how does he become better than the other ones? That we will now accept him and reject the others. Wallahi, we must think seriously about this. There are things that are more important to you. In the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, even when some people went for jihad, some were kept at home to teach women. Because the teaching of the deen is a very important aspect of Islam. And at no time will we all go and leave our people here. We must stay and teach here. If you look at uh, Al-Mughni by Ibn Qudama, he says that if you are in a land that is Darul Kufr, but there are Muslims in the land, and you are in a position to teach Islam to those Muslims in the land, you are not allowed to perform hijrah and leave those Muslims behind under the, 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 the rule of kufr and just go to another Muslim nation and stay. You don't perform hijrah. Your hijrah will be to stay with your people and establish Islam there. Uthman bin Fodio was a Muslim in the Sokoto Caliphate when there was virtually no Islam in the leadership. He stayed there, he taught the people until they grew strong enough to rebel against the un-Islamic leadership of those people. And that was because those people had become something else. Their leadership was completely un-Islamic and they were completely against anybody that was teaching Islam. So when you teach and you are fought, you fight back. And that's what he did. And he won and he established the Islamic Dawla. He didn't perform hijrah to anywhere. In fact, he never performed hajj in his entire life. 
as it is stated. So we stay here, we teach the deen here. It's a greater jihad than just going to, to slaughter people, you know, helpless people. You just go and catch people, Christians, and slaughter them, and show the world you are slaughtering people. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you're going to slaughter a hen, a hen, you do not allow it to see you sharpening your knife. A hen that is halal for you to eat. But you just come and take the light in slaughtering human beings and showing the world. I don't know what brand of Islam this is. I have never read that the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim practice this kind of Islam. So I caution you. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make sure that you go patiently through the books of Islam. Go to ulama and see, you are allowed to see from what they say. Compare what they tell you to what you think. And between you and Allah be sincere. And see, are you acting on knowledge? Or are you acting on pure emotion? If you're acting on pure emotion, you will never succeed. You will never succeed. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَات If you are a mu'min and then you add knowledge to it, you are greater than the person that is just a mu'min without knowledge. So when they say, ah, some sahaba died without knowing anything, all they had was kalima to shahada. They never even prayed. They never even do any, did anything. And they got the shahada. Yes, that is true. But are you in their condition? Don't you have the, don't you have the, the leverage? Don't you have the chance to seek knowledge? Why will you want to die without seeking the knowledge when you have the chance to do it? In their own case, they had no chance. But you have the chance. You have ulama all around you and you say they are rubbish. You will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and answer questions. So Allah al-Azim, you know, I remember that about 10 years ago or so, in this institution, some students like that sent me a question during Buhari class like this. They sent a question and the question was that there are girls that are naked on campus and so on and they want to teach them a lesson. What do I say about that? And I said, it's not right. Take it easy. You are not the leaders. Do what you can. Preach. You cannot change all of the people at the same time. لا تهدي من أحببت. No matter how you try, you can't guide all the people. You go to a Christian and you fight her, you lash, you, you, you flog her for not wearing the hijab. Did the Quran say that? Did the Qur'an say that? Did the hadith say that? That you go and flog a Christian for not wearing the hijab. Even if it's a Muslim sister, you as an individual, you just go and catch a sister and begin to flog her. Didn't you read that Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh was passing one day and he heard music in a house. When he peeped, through the fence, he saw people dancing, singing, and drinking alcohol, and so on. And doing terrible things. He jumped into the house. He crashed into the house. And then he arrested the old man. And then the old man said, wow, what have you come to do? Who are you? He said, I'm Omar bin Khattab. Omar bin Khattab behaving like this? He said, yes, I caught you committing a crime. He said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tadukhulu buyutan ghayra buyutikum. Hatta tasta'zinu wa tusallimu ala ahliha. And then Umar said, oh, okay, I see. So you and I have now committed a sin against Allah. So may Allah forgive both of us. 
So he could no longer arrest him. Because he also had gone against the law because he was emotional. He didn't use knowledge, he used emotion. The aim is to correct an ill, is to correct something that's wrong. Unfortunately, he didn't follow the right path. He made a mistake and that sinner corrected him. And he took the correction. So those students wrote, and I said, no, take it easy, this and that. I'm sure they must have said, Kai, leave that man alone. Maybe the government has bought him. So they went into the school, flogged some girls. And the sad thing that happened is that they were overpowered than the, that the, uh, by the non-Muslims. They were beaten blue and black. <laughs> They were dealt with seriously. And it's a shame on Islam and Muslims. Some of them were arrested. Some of them were, were rusticated. Some of them were expelled. And after many years, I noticed that I will recognize somebody as an ex-student of Federal University of Technology. I will want to say salam to him and I find the person is avoiding me. And then I heard later that that group, that they are ashamed. They are ashamed to come face to face with me now. Because they are regretting that they disobeyed me at that time. And they regretted later. And said if they had known, they would have followed what I said. So because of that regret, they don't even want to come face to face with me again. And the thing is that at the time that they would have listened and gained from it, they thought every person was useless except them. And now this boy is singing in the hands of the DSS. He's mentioning some things and some Muslims are getting arrested. Is this the kind of imam that is pushing you to jihad? That you were just arrested and tortured a little and you're beginning to say some things that are implicating some other Muslims. Was it the strength of your imam that was taking you there in the first place? You look at the people that are going there to slaughter others. You find they are hardly knowledgeable. They are hardly, they hardly understand Islam. There are very few of them that are hufad of the Quran. In fact, they do not even know what the Quran is talking about. All they can say is Allahu Akbar. That's all they can say. Even that, they probably do not even know the tajweed of that. But now they believe nobody knows except them. These are mostly people who are actually not learned. So they don't understand the deen. They will not be able to say this particularly is right or wrong. They have just been brainwashed and that is all. Wallahi, I urge you to calm down. And to know that you fight better for Islam when you are knowledgeable. You fight better for Islam and Islam gains more from you if you're calm enough to work under a leadership. If you do not have a common leadership within the Muslim Ummah and you operate like that, Ashtatan, Wallahi al-Azim, we are all going to lose. There is no way we can be strong. There is no way we can win if we are so scattered. Whatever we establish will be washed away. Because we did not follow the rules. أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you want to act, do not... Do not, do not ever think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have to wait for you. And that you go before Allah tells you to go. You go before Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells you to go. Wallahi, do not ever do that. If there is any command in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says establish salah, 
go and perform salah. There are rules concerning going to perform salah. There are rules. It's not just like that, that you've been asked to perform salah, so you just go ahead and perform salah. There are rules concerning going to perform salah. So if there is any act of ibadah that you've been asked to go and participate in, you must know that it has rules. If you break the rules, you will not be rewarded for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our mistakes and guide us to the path of Islam, to the path of Hidayah. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Do we have time for questions? Huh? Ten minutes. Do we have questions that are related to what we discussed today? Yes. Read this for me. I can't see it very well. That one. السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام. جزاك الله خيرا يا شيخ. وأنتم فجزاكم الله خيرا. شيخ نايت فور ذا كونديشنز اوف ليفينغ هجرة فروم بلد الشرك تو بلد فروم بلد الشرك تو بلد الإسلام. بيكوز بيبول اوف ذا تيك ياه؟ ذا بيرسون سيد شو شيخ نايت فور ذا كونديشنز اوف ليفينغ هجرة فروم بلد الشرك تو بلد الإسلام. بيكوز بيبول اوف ذا تيك ياه؟ ذا بيرسون سيد شو شيخ نايت فور ذا كونديشنز اوف ليفينغ هجرة فروم بلد الشرك تو بلد الإسلام. بيكوز بيبول the way the world was in the time of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very different now. It's no longer so. Now. Things have even changed. But even then in those days, you see, if Allah, if Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could tell people, la hijrata ba'd al fatih, right? No hijrah after fatah. What does it mean? That at the time that people were making the hijrah, it was under the instruction of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said perform hijrah, but Rasul had to say go to this place, go to that place. So you still need a leadership. This is what should be done. The leadership says, okay people go to that place. We have so and so there that will take care of you and will communicate with them and so and so. It's not just that anybody will just rise and go to anywhere he wants and say he has performed hijrah. Even if the land is free for you to perform hijrah like that. But you must know that now hijrah is no longer as easy as it was in that time. In fact... You know a place had to be chosen where you would get somebody to accommodate you. That's where the Muslims would perform the hijrah. So it's not just anywhere. You have to know first of all there is a place where we will be accommodated. And then you go there and seek asylum. That's how it was performed. And there was not a time that some sahaba would just get up like that and perform hijrah to anywhere they like, and then the, 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 the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would uh, learn of that only later. It wasn't done like that. They were an organized people. And we must remain organized. So you just can't get up today and say you're performing hijrah, you're going to Niger, for instance. You're going to Niger under whose leadership? With what aim? Who is monitoring you? Who can tell you from there, come back to this place, things are good now? If you just went on your own. Wallahu alam. Yes? I can't read these things. This one says, what are the characteristics of an Islamic leader that is linked this with any proof to show that Sultan of Sokoto can be considered as a Muslim leader? First of all, in Nigeria, the Sultan of Sokoto is a Muslim, isn't he? Huh? He's a Muslim, isn't he? Or is he a Christian? Is he a Jew? Is he a Kafir? Is he a pagan? Is he a Mushrik? 
Is any of us as an individual qualified to brand him a kafir or a mushrik? We are not qualified. That's not done by individuals. That is done by a court of law in Islam. Only the Qadi can make such declarations. And you know the Qadi cannot just make such declarations on emotions alone. There have to be reasons. And then the Sultan of Sokoto is officially the one recognized to represent Muslims in all their affairs. He has to say, this is what will be done. If there is anything and the Muslims' opinion is needed, he is the one that is consulted. This makes him the leader. Because this is the kind of leadership you need over a people. That it will have to be your word that will stand on, on, the, on behalf of all the Muslims of your place. It has to be your word, whatever you say, that will be acted upon. You automatically become their leader. Does any other Muslim have this power in this country? Huh? This is why I say the Sultan is the leader of the Muslims. If you have any other person that has these qualifications, then maybe you give us. And we look at it and see that, okay, that is more qualified and so he becomes the leader. Leadership is not simply through knowledge. It is supposed to be through knowledge. That the person must be very knowledgeable. If possible, the person should even be good looking. He should have the physique. He should also have the acceptance of the people. He should be the one that has the know-how, the leadership know-how, that will be able to lead the people. These are all some of the requirements that leaders need in the Muslim Ummah. Under ideal situations, that's how it should be. In some cases, the leader may not meet all of these requirements. The only requirement he will meet is that he is now the one that has authority over the Muslims. Once he has that, the other requirements collapse. And he automatically becomes the leader of the Muslims. And the Sultan is the only person I know in the whole of Nigerian, Nigeria. In the, the entire Muslim population of Nigeria, the Sultan is the only person I know that has this instrument. If any other person has, please let me know. If it's Islamic leadership that you're talking about, the leader of the Muslims, the one that instructs the Muslims on what to do, that is in case the president is not a Muslim. If the president is a Muslim, of course you know the president has more powers than the sultan. Doesn't he? He does. What does he say? He says, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. What will God Allah create the earth? Is this true that he created it for the sake of his servant? <laughs> Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he created it for what? For the sake of his servant, our prophet Muhammad. Okay, that he created the world for the sake of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I do not know that in any authentic hadith. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he created uh, mankind and the jinns to worship him. And he also said in another ayah that he did not create them for play and waste of time. He created them in truth that he be worshipped and so on. I know all of that. But that he created it for the sake of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I do not know that in the Qur'an, I do not know that in any authentic hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This one says, I need Islamic ruling concerning performing salah while on journey, such as inside trail, railway or bus for a long journey. If, if you want to pray anywhere you are, the rule is that you must perform ablution. 
The rule, another rule is that if you want to pray, you have to pray standing. And then facing the Qibla. But then if you find yourself in situations that may not allow some of these conditions, then they are relaxed. For instance, you don't have ablution. It's time for salah. And there is no way you can perform ablution because there is no water around. You look for it anywhere around you, there is no water. And the time is going to lapse. You perform the salah with tayammum and it is valid. So there you must not perform wudu. Because it's impossible. Also, if you can stand, then you should pray while standing. وَقُومُ لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ قُومُ Stand. So you should pray while standing. But if you can't stand because you are sick, like the Prophet was once sick, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he sat and performed his salah, then you sit. Or, it's not that you're sick, but you are on a vehicle. And being on that vehicle is not going to permit you to stand. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed on his ass while sitting. On his donkey while sitting on the donkey. So if you are in a vehicle, you can sit and perform the salah. So if you are in a plane, there is no way you can stand. It's impossible for you to stand, then you sit. If you can perform wudu, you go and perform wudu. If it's impossible to perform wudu, because the, uh, what do they call them, air hostess will be telling you that please do not use water in the toilet or anywhere to perform ablution. Because if water spills on the floor of the plane, it could get to the wires that are connected there and it can cause an accident. If you have an accident in the plane that is in the sky, you know what that means. You know what that means. So if for your ablution you are going to cause such havoc, then it's haram for you to perform that ablution. And now the time for the prayer will lapse while you are sitting in that plane. You perform the prayer without the wudu. Because it is better to perform salah within its time than to perform it with wudu. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was asked, Ayyul a'mali afdal? He said, As-salatu li waqtiha. What act of worship is the best? And he said, praying within its time. So praying within its time is better than praying with purity. So even if you're impure, but the time is going to lapse and you can't purify, then pray with that your impurity within the time so that the time does not lapse. So salah always goes with the time. So don't allow the time to lapse. So in that case, you could perform the salah without ablution, without even tayammum, if there is no place to perform the tayammum, and while standing, or while sitting, even if you cannot face the qibla. In that case, wherever you face, inshaAllah, Allah will accept your salah. So you pray ima'an. While sitting, you do the takbiratul ihram, you perform, uh, you, you recite the fatih, you say the dua ul istifta, where you say the isti'adha, basmala, and then fatiha, because basmala is part of fatiha. When you finish the fatiha, you say the surah, and then when you are performing ruku, you bend a little. When you are performing, when it's time for sujood, you bend more than, than you bent in, in the ruku. So your, your forehead does not have to touch the ground there. And you do that till the end and say the salam and you have said the salah. Insha'Allah ta'ala. We've run out of time.
اللهم قسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يرحمنا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وباركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته